be in Second uh, Corinthians chapter five. I had way more jokes, but uh, as a uh, um, as a, as a new preacher, I'm you know not very good at it. But but those of you who are aspiring preachers, you know, um, teenage boys that are you know I'm going to preach someday and stuff like that. Um, it's a good idea to have your jokes kind of in mind what you're going to say. Just don't have it verbatim. You need some spontaneity because people can tell when it's not spontaneous. It's just not as funny. So you, you got to, it's, it's kind of like when you write your sermon, you have an outline. You know, you didn't write it out word for word. Um, same way with your jokes. Just have a skeleton and then you fill it in and everybody laughs. That's just a random tip. These are things that you don't learn um, beforehand. So I'm just trying to help you out. Um, I want to go through the whole chapter of 2 Corinthians 5. We should be done uh, on time. Doesn't seem like it, but we will. Um, but um, but it's broken down into uh, five different sections that I see here, and so they're very relevant to us. Um, it's a it's a wonderful chapter. The whole book of Second Corinthians is just one of those things. Everybody, you know, as you read through the Bible and as you listen to preaching and as you grow and you know go on in the Christian life and everything, there are certain certain passages, certain books, certain places that really speak to you. And Second uh, Corinthians, uh, through all the years, is really just continued to be um, a source of great inspiration and, and just is really um, I'm just dialed into that it is my level um, so it, it's it's a wonderful book and I think this chapter is a wonderful chapter it's it's all encompassing of um, the promises of God and what God expects of us and, and so I, I like efficiency um, and I like things that are uh, um, packaged in such a way that you can kind of take it with you it's kind of like when you when you're on the road and you're driving um, I look for something to eat that I can eat with one hand and still, you know, steer. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm not a guy that goes to the, to the rest stop and gets soup or gets a sandwich or something because you're going to die, you know, trying to drive and do that. Um, so it's got to be in bar form usually. Um, and I can steer with my knees as I open it real quick, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, you do it too. Don't laugh at me. Uh, that's a good idea. You will do it now because that's a good idea. You ain't got to stop to open it up. You know, you don't waste time at rest stops. Get going. You got somewhere to be. You don't get there. So, Second Corinthians five. We'll start in verse one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I love the King James Bible just because of the wording. I mean, how are you going to forget that? We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, you know, just the wording of that. Like I've already got it memorized, just because it's so. Um, I wouldn't say strange, but it's just so unique, you know. It, it just there's these phrases in there, you know. Uh, it's in Acts. Um, it's uh, lewd fellows of the baser sort, you know. It's just great, you know. You, you've already got that memorized. I mean, it's just the phrasing. I love it. Um, anyway, um, NIV doesn't have that, by the way. Um, NIV totally butchers this. Can't remember any of it, you know. Anyway, um, uh, uh, we have a an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being found that, that being clothed we shall not be found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that immortality might be swallowed up of life so let's pray and we'll we'll break down this chapter a little bit father we thank you for the um thank you for today thank you for the chance to have church thank you for the bible you've given us and and we live in a day and age lord where we have the full complete revelation lord uh, genesis to, to revelations um every word of it we can trust every word of it preserved um and and every word of it the authority certainly lord of of your standards and your expectations for us and of course words that make us wise unto salvation um wonderful treasures lord wonderful profit that we can have if we um conform ourselves to it and allow the, the word of god to change us lord we pray this morning as we look at this chapter that you would take what you've laid upon my heart and that you would um, tailor it to each of us as individuals. Help us, Lord, to get the truth that you have for us. Help us to uh, love you a little bit more. Help us to change and conform and be more um, like Jesus and more like what you want us to be. Um, every, you know, it's just a stepping stone, Lord. It's another, it's another day. It's another sermon. And we'll hear thousands of these, Lord, uh, Lord willing. But we pray that you would uh, use this one today and store the word in our hearts, God, that we can use it later. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so first of all, the uh, first four verses of this chapter, we see the promise of the resurrection body. Um, 
verse one is is like I said, it's kind of it's it's wordy, but it, he's talking about your body. When your body is dissolved, your body dies. You have a building of God, eternal in the heavens. It says, and it says, for in this we groan. He mentions twice just in these four verses the groaning, which as the older you get, the more groaning that there's going to be. Um, I've I'm getting close to forty, and honestly, um, there are a lot of mornings where you kind I need a ro- kind of a running start to get out of bed so it's not like you know it's not like when I was you know 10 years ago or 15 years ago where I'm just like being about you know now it's like all right oh. <laughs> you know and you need that you know the older you get there's more the more groaning that you have and so I appreciate that when you're young you're like oh, I don't know what you're talking about but it's going to happen um stuff like that and so we we are looking forward to that resurrection body. It's eternal, we see in verse 1. Um, we, we see that it's not made with hands, um, in, in, uh, um, also in verse 1. And then in verse 4, we see is that uh, mortality might be swallowed up of life. And mortality, you know, the concept of death is something that we're very familiar with. Um, you know, even if we don't have any direct experience of it, it's the one event that Ecclesiastes says happeneth to all. You know, it's, it's something that we... Um, have to look forward to, uh, if, if you would. And as, as profound and as permanent and as big a deal as death is, and it's a huge deal, um, it's swallowed up of life. We have that promise that we look forward to that as big as that is, life is the, the eternal life that we get it is so much bigger, it swallows that up, you know, that it's just, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's an end of, it's a, you know, it's a huge guy who's standing by himself is very imposing and very large, but when he's standing in the middle of Disneyland and there's people everywhere and you can't even see him anymore, you know, you're in like a helicopter or something looking down on a big crowded place, you know, he doesn't really stand out anymore. There's a, he's swallowed up. And so um, it's kind of like that. We'll look at some other passages that talk about this resurrection body. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 15, I'll warn you ahead of time, keep your finger there in 2 Corinthians 5 because um, we're going to turn back to that. Um, I must have had Derek in mind because we're going to be turned into all kinds of different passages, and mostly in the New Testament, so this is going to help you find them easier through experience. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42, it says, uh, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So we see that the body that we are resurrected in is different than the one that we have, right? Um, and we see that you know we're, we die in corruption, but it's in, we're raised in incorruption. You know, we uh, um, it's sown in dishonor. You know, and death is certainly dishonorable, um, and yet it's it's raised in honor. Um, so it's 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 much better. It's different. It is not according. If you look at these verses, it's it's not really a, according to the physical rules and the laws that we've always known. Uh, if you go back to verse thirty-five, it says, "Some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come?" And so the the sense is, well, I can't. I can't understand this this concept of resurrection because what kind of body are you going to get? You know, when you think in terms of what of, of the laws of of nature and physics and everything that you're accustomed to, then the resurrected body is is kind of hard to fathom. You know, how how great can this possibly be? Um, verse thirty six: Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain it may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God hath given it a body that hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So the, the seed that you plant for, for wheat or for grain doesn't look like what it becomes. It becomes something much more glorious and, and much different, but that seed has to die first, and that's um, a picture of our body and what it, what it goes through. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, um, in accordance with that, it says, I mean, we can't even imagine what God has prepared for us, right? Um, I think it's uh, it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And so we, we have no idea 
what we have to look forward to, but what God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 here is that um, it's wonderful. Uh, if you go forward to, um, well, in the same passage, verse 39, we see that not all resurrections are equal, right? So all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of birds, uh, of another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. So just the comparison between um, these different things. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. And so the as, as the stars differ in glory and the sun and moon differ in glory, so um, the resurrected bodies differ in glory. And, and so I'll show you some passages. Uh, if you go to Hebrews 11. Uh, no, hold on a second. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 9. I'll make it a little easier on you. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So not every, uh, you know, I mean, these days we have participation trophies. And everybody has to be equal, and nobody's really a winner, but nobody's a loser. Um, God doesn't give participation trophies. Um, he says that there. So you got a lot of people running in a race, but there's one that, that wins the prize, you know. And so, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So they play by the rules, and they do everything, and, and everything's focused to obtain a corruptible crown. But he says, we're, we're trying to obtain an incorruptible crown. And he says, I therefore so run... Not as uncertainly. So I don't, I'm running, but not aimlessly, not without a, a goal in mind. Um, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so we see that there is a prize to obtain. Um, go, f uh, go forward to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 35. It says, uh, women receive their, you know, and this is the, the, the big chapter on faith. Um, the big chapter on the resurrection, for example, is 1 Corinthians 15. There's chapters that are just dedicated to um, important topics, and Hebrews 11 is one of those. Um, this one's about faith and about um, the, the patterns and examples of faith and the people that came before us. But it says in verse 35, women receive their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they, may, that they might obtain a better better." Resurrection. They suffered without compromise because they, because they knew the exhortation that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, and, and that, as it says earlier in this chapter, that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That their suffering without compromise would allow them to obtain a better resurrection. It says it, you know, it says it in the passage there. Uh, if you go back to, um, go back to Luke nineteen. Luke 19, verse 24, it says, And he said unto them that stood by, and this is the parable of the talents. Um, if you're familiar with this, a uh, guy got um, God. So th this, this Lord distributed um, you know, money or treasure, you know, it says talents there, to some of his servants and expected them to uh, do business with it. Uh, some of them did, one of them didn't. And it says in verse uh, 24, the one that didn't, And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that had ten pounds. So this one's the uh, pounds instead of talents. But um, so th the guy that had the one pound that didn't do anything with it, hid in a napkin, laid it in the earth, and said, "You know, I feared you because you're an austere man and you um, are unfair." Essentially, is what he accuses him of. He says, "I just hid it in the earth because I was afraid." And so, um, so the Lord, you know, takes it from him. He tells him, "Take take from him the pound and give it to him that had ten pounds." And they said unto him, "Lord, he hath ten pounds." So they're all standing there like. But he's already got ten. Um, for I say unto you that it, unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. And so God is not a leftist. Um, we earn things for heaven. All right? um, not all resurrections are equal. 
those that have suffered and lived for God and been faithful can expect reward for that. And people that, that didn't take God seriously um, were saved, sure. Um, and that's wonderful. And salvation's, you know, the foundation that we have to have. But as it says in, uh, oh, it's in 1 Corinthians. I should have wrote this down. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about the foundation is Christ, but then what you build on that foundation is tried by fire. See, all of us, and I'm jump ahead of myself, when we give it, when we stand before Jesus upon our death, and both our knees bow, and this tongue that you have in your mouth confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, the day is coming that you will do this, um, that your work is tried by fire, and if you've built a, a structure, you know, if, if you've built a life of wood, hay, and stubble, you're going to suffer loss, you're still saved, all right? But you suffer loss, whereas they that built out of um, gold, silver, precious stones, things that abide a fire, you receive a reward. Does that make sense? And so we're rewarded based on what we do. And so salvation is very important, and I'll get to that um, in a minute, but understand it's, it's what you do. Um, we're not all equal in heaven. There is... Um, you know, there, there is reward to be had for putting God first and, and all that kind of stuff. So, but just understand that the promise of the resurrection body um, is, is we also look forward to the rewards that we would get and, and stuff like that. So we see that. Back to um, 2 Corinthians 5. So the second thing we see, starting in verse 6, is that heaven is to be with and to know God. Uh, verse 6, it says, Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So if we're in the body, we're absent from the Lord, obviously, because we don't, we don't see him. Um, we walk by faith. Uh, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So it would be better to be with God. Um, go back to John 17. John 17 um, has the definition of eternal life. And I like that God defines these things, that they're not just vague concepts that, that can't be grasped, that um, Jesus in this, in, this, uh, in this passage here, in this verse here, defines what, what eternal life is. It says in uh, John 17, verse 3, it says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so knowing God is eternal life. Uh, go back to Psalm 16. One of only a couple of forays into the Old Testament. You guys might get there faster because your hands aren't all shaky. Um, Psalm 16, verse 11, familiar verse. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So being in God's presence is enough, um, is, is eternal life. That's, that's heaven, right? Um, go forward to Revelation 7. Look at a couple of verses in Revelation. Revelation gives us a, a glimpse of heaven that you don't, you don't necessarily get anywhere else. Revelation 7, verse 9, it says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Uh, go forward to uh, chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 3. Chapter 21, verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. It's a beautiful phrase. The former things are passed away. 
And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. We see two things in these passages. First of all, in Revelation 7, we see an innumerable host standing before the throne of God and bowing down and worshiping, worshiping him and praising him. And you see that a lot in Revelation. And what's striking about that is it doesn't, it's not forced. There are not angels with sharp sticks, you know, bow. You know, it's pretty willing. You know, those, those four and 20 uh, elders are mentioned a, a couple times, and they're mentioned falling down before the throne and throwing their, their crowns at his feet. That's willing, you understand? It is so wonderful to be in God's presence that you're not in heaven going, man, what's that over there? Man, what's that? You're in heaven going, God. Does that make sense? Um, you know, it just kind of gives you that clue in the scriptures that you're, you're, not, you're not standing around going, hey, uh, what do you want to do later? Or you're thinking about all the cool stuff you do want to do or all the food you want to eat or whatever. I mean, that's what we would be doing on earth. But in heaven, it's like, I don't see anything else. God's here. You know, look at that. You know, and, and it takes the, I think it's in, uh, it's in one of the, the good epistles, you know, the, the nice epistles. It's like Philippians or it's um, uh, Ephesians. It's one of those where, where, uh, or uh, Colossians, where, where uh, Paul writes that God uses the ages to come. It takes the ages to come for God to, dem- to show us and teach us how, how wonderful he is. Does that make sense? And so heaven... Our, our, our concept of heaven, if we're fleshly and carnal, is like, we we'll get to be with God. I guess that's exciting. But when you're, when you're spiritually minded, you realize that's all I need. And, and that's all anybody needs. And that's more than enough. You know, as we read earlier in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, um, immortality is swallowed up of life. You know, it's so, much, it's so much bigger and richer and fuller than anything that we could imagine. And so heaven is to be with God, and that's a wonderful thing. And that's what we want to be is with God. Not just to be with him, but to know him. And, that, and that's the other key aspect of this, is knowing him. Him revealing himself to us. Understanding him in deeper ways that we couldn't understand with the, the very limited minds that we have. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And so that's what we had to look forward to, heaven uh, being with and knowing God. The next thing we see in this chapter, back to 2 Corinthians 5, the next thing we see in the chapter is the judgment seat of Christ which I alluded to a minute ago, down in verse 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, <clears throat> according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So, a couple of things we see there. We see the judgment seat of Christ, and we see that every one of us is going to appear before him, and we're going to give an account for everything the good and the bad, the whole thing. Um, it says in another place in the New Testament, I think Jesus said it, that every idle word we will give an account for. So it's, God's very detail-oriented, and he remembers everything. He wrote everything down. And so we'll give an account for everything, um, which as is a good idea not to sin lightly, you know, because you're, you know, the, the, you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to stand before your Savior and give an account, you know, you did that, Why? You know, what, what was up with that, sir? You know, I mean, um, it's every idle word, you know. Um, that's, I, I, I don't talk much, but I, I have a lot of idle words, so that, that worries me a little bit. And those of you that talk significantly more than me should be really worried. But anyway, <laughs> um, but we'll give an account, we see there, but, but also in verse 11, we know the terror of the Lord. And it's the terror of the Lord, it says, that, is motivation for us to persuade men. And the, and the reality is, is that there is wrath coming for sin. Uh, if you go back to Romans chapter 3, we'll look at a bunch of verses here. Romans 3, if you look at verse uh, 19, it says, now, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Every mouth be stopped. There's no excuse anymore. We we stand guilty before him. If you go back to John 12. And verse 48. This is another one of those foundational definition kind of verses that... Um, 
that you'll notice here, if, if you read carefully, you pick these things out. Um, Jesus is saying in verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the standard of judgment is the word. It's, it's this Bible that you're holding. This is what we're responsible for. Um, which is nice to know that we, we can know what the standard of judgment is. It's not arbitrary. It's not something that um, we can't figure out, but it's also scary because there's a lot in there. Um, but we stand before God guilty. And we will all be judged. To go forward to uh, Hebrews 9. Or if you've given up, just listen along. <laughs> Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment, so Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and, unto, um, and so on and so forth. But we're appointed, we're appointed as men, as humans, once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so judgment is appointed unto us. We will give an account. Um, if you go back to Romans 14, maybe keep a finger in Romans too because we're going to be in there a few times. Romans 14, verse 10, it says, uh, Why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of, a, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Um, Hebrews 10.31 tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Revelation 19.15 talks about wrath and bloodshed for sin. Same thing in Revelation 16, 19. If you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, right before Hebrews, if you happen to have kept your place there. If not, just listen along. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, And unto you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So they will be punished. It says flaming fire and vengeance. Jesus comes back the second time. He's, he's pretty angry. Um, who will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord? There's, there's a separation there. And so when we die, we're going to go to heaven or hell. And the, the penalty of sin is eternal. Revelation 20, uh, talks, verses 13 through 15, talks about the lake of fire. Revelation 21 also, um, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If you go back to Isaiah 66, I wish, um, I wish the JWs were right, honestly, that there was just a soul annihilation and that the, the ones that were bad, God just doesn't resurrect them and you know, there's not eternal suffering and, you know, the eternal aspect of it. I wish that was true. That would be a lot tidier. That would be a lot easier to deal with. Uh, I feel a lot better about that, but it's just not true. Uh, Isaiah 66, verse 24. Last, last verse of the book, it says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Talking about, in verse 22, the new heavens and the new earth. So this isn't, um, this isn't a different time. This is when it's all done, the final judgment, um, the judgment seat of Christ, the white throne judgment, where um, you know Jesus is back and everybody's hiding. The, the earth and the heavens fled and couldn't find a place to hide uh, for the fierceness of his countenance. But that's, that's, what, that's what they have looked forward to. There, neither, shall their, um, neither shall their fire be quenched, they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And so the, the, the penalty of sin is eternal, and it's terrible. And the wrath of God is coming for sin. It, it's the reality. And so the, what, we, what we need then, all of us, is to be redeemed and be, to be delivered from the wrath of sin. And if you go back to 2 Corinthians uh, ver, chapter 5, starting in verse 14, we see the redemption the, the redemption that God has provided for us. Verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all. So universal guilt. So we're all under sin, 
right? There's none righteous, no, not one. That includes you and I. And he that died, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, we had these, before we were saved, we had these ideas of what Christ was and what Jesus was, and, and we had a picture of him in our mind, and so on and so forth, of what he thought he was, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Because we're new creatures, right? So we know him differently now. We know him truly now because um, we're changed, we're redeemed. And so the concept of judgment is, is really what got my attention. I was a uh, uh, young man um, in the military, had a religious upbringing, and I was religious. And uh, I, had a, I had a friend, a Christian friend, who for whatever reason was really burdened for my soul. And uh, I thought he was... I liked him. He's a nice guy, but man, I thought he was kind of quirky and weird about that. You know, always worried about my uh, my soul and stuff. And I'm like, you know, he would ask me the question. You know, he asked the question, "Are you going to heaven when you die?" And I'd say, "Yeah." You know, Jesus died for my sins. You know, I learned that in uh, in confirmation in Lutheran uh, the Lutheran Church. You know, um, well, what do you say to that? You know, you're you're, you're kind of as a soul, and you're kind of stymied there because now the burden is to prove to me that I'm not saved, and that's hard to do. You know, because because you start working that you start working that angle, and then you have to start dealing with pride. And when pride comes into it, contentions and bars and stuff like that, and you're not getting through there. And so he he was wise enough to kind of kind of eye me a little bit, and you know, kind of try a, a couple of times. But one one day um, before we moved up here, he was in my office and and sitting on my couch, and, and you know, he told me that we would all give an account for what we've done. And, and, you know, he quoted me that verse. Um, uh, I don't think it was uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, but it was one of the other verses we read where we will give a, an account um, to God. And so when he said that, he said that to me. We, we talked a little bit more, and he left. And then after he left, I just kind of slumped in my chair. And I said, well, if that's true, what on earth is the point of trying to be good? And it revealed to me that what I was trusting in, though I had some religious knowledge, I mean, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God, born of a virgin, died on the cross for my sins. I believe that, um, I believe the Trinity, I believe Genesis 1-1, I believe literal, uh, I was a young earth creationist, uh, as much as I could be in a, in a society that was telling me all of that was false, and I was certainly on the verge of walking away from that, because I just, I would you know, I mean, there's no counter-argument to the big voice that's telling you, you know, what's what the world considers to be true you know there's just, you know, i just hadn't heard any any counter argument to it so i'm like they're so confident in how they say this and it comes at me from so many different angles man this must be it you know maybe all this stuff was fun tradition i learned as a kid you know santa claus easter bunny jesus in heaven and god you know maybe it's maybe it's all the same deal you know honestly and so um but but i realized that that was illustrative to me that I was, though I had some religious knowledge, I wasn't trusting in Christ. I was trusting in my ability to be good. And that revealed that, man, I don't have that ability. You know, I, I had sin. I was, I was convicted right there. And, and over the course of time, uh, God would reveal to me two things. He'd reveal to me, first of all, how good he was. He'd reveal to me his love and his mercy. Um, he started opening the, the Bible to me. And uh, like it had never been opened before, and it was amazing. And, and so he established with me, uh, understatement of, of the decade here, but he established that God is good, right? And then the next thing he established in one day was that I was not good. And that led me to get saved. And I, and I, uh, I trusted Christ on my living room floor upon realizing I've fallen short. And that was a, that was a big deal, and it changed everything. But... but the redemptive work of Jesus, he, he did it all. We sang that song, um, uh, Jesus paid it all, and, and he did. And when we come to that knowledge, we understand Jesus a lot differently than we did. He's not just a buddy. He's not just a, um, a good teacher. You know, he's not, he's not just the Son of God in some abstract term. But now, to me, he's Savior. Now, to me, he's God, and he's high, and he's lifted up, and he's um, the judge, and he's... Um, He's, uh, he's, he's everything. He's, he's, he has the preeminence. He's the all in all, you know, that, that he's all I need. Um, much different. If you go down to same chapter, verse 19, it says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, be, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
He took our place on the cross. The redemptive work of Christ was that he saved us from wrath. If you go back to Romans 5, and the wrath of God's scary, and I, and I really didn't want to deal with that. And as a, as a believer, I can, I can bring out the wrath of God. I can bring uh, the severity of God on my life if I don't take him seriously, I don't live like I'm supposed to, I don't use, um, I don't take that light that he's given me and use it responsibly and, and do with it what I'm supposed to. Um, we ought to be afraid of that as believers. But being, um, being delivered from wrath is in uh, Romans 5, you look at verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so Christ died for us not when we were trying to do our best, not when uh, we were cleaning up our life and turning over new leaves and, and we're doing, starting to do things good, and then God comes to us and says, okay, finally, I can deal with you now. You're cleaned up. That's not how it works. He died for us in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our iniquity, in the midst of our failure, in, in the midst of our filth. He came and he died for us. Much more than, verse 9, being now justified by his blood, which is an incredible statement that by his blood, we are justified. Just, and, and the saying is just as if we had never sinned. It is completely expunged and cleansed away. There's no stain. There's no mark. We shall be saved from wrath through him. That's how we're delivered from the wrath that is to come from sin. It is from him. Uh, and he is a free gift. He's a gift that must be received. Uh, if you go to um, you know, John 1. You don't have to turn there, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to be sons of God. If you're here uh, for Sunday school this morning, you understand that Jesus is a gift that must be received. It's voluntary. It, it, uh, you, you cannot be born again because your, your mom or your dad or your grandpa or, or um, your friend or you're in church this morning or you did some good things or you know about this stuff. It's not about knowledge and it's not about others. It's about you receiving a gift. And if you realize that I've fallen short, I'm not worthy of God, I'm a sinner. If you realize that you need to be redeemed and you receive that gift of salvation, God gives it freely to whoever wants it, whoever would take it. But it's something you have to receive. You're either going to receive it or you're going to refuse it. Um, to them gave you power to be sons of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10 uh, for if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So there's, you know, the pastor preached on this, uh, might have been five years ago, it seemed like it was several months ago, but he preached on the fact that there is not one necessarily universal way to be saved. There's kind of different methods, you would say, but it's all the same deal as far as receiving Christ as Savior. It's you are diminished in your sight to nothing and you realize that Jesus is everything and you receive that salvation freely. You receive that salvation as, as guilty and unworthy and astounded that God would do that and, and fearful even that he would do something of such magnitude and give such an important and precious and unspeakable gift for you and I as individuals who were in filth. And we're in filth because we're born in filth, but also because we chose to be in filth. And a, and a holy, perfect God who's got a lot going on in this humongous, ginormous creation that he's made is ever patient and ever kind and ever considerate to condescend to creatures like us and pay that price when it wasn't his fault, it was ours. And it's, it's the redemptive work of Christ is an amazing thing and that gift that must be received um, in order to be had. Um, there's no other way to do it. Um, you know, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And as he gave his Son, we have to receive him as Savior to be saved, to be delivered from our sin. Nothing else can save you. Like I said, I was, I was a wicked man, but I was trying to do good. You know, I was trying to be nice to others. I was really honestly trying to live that golden rule. I could say that honestly I was trying. It just, that wasn't going to atone for my sin, you know. That, that made me feel good, and it, it assuaged some of the guilt that I carried around that I didn't know I was carrying around. It's like the Pilgrim's Progress book, you know. If you've ever read that, uh, the, the main uh, protagonist in the story is carrying around this huge burden, 
And I think he doesn't know where it came from or why, or why he even has to carry it around, but it's there. And he can't put it down until, um, until Jesus takes it off of him. You know what I mean? And so um, it's a gift that must be received. And then the next thing, the last thing we see in this chapter is the ministry of reconciliation. And that's verse 15. It says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And so then, after having received that gift, and having been delivered from sin, and being cleansed, and be made a new creature, uh, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're brand new. It's like hitting the reset button. Um, I used to play video games in, and, uh, you know, like Sega Genesis days back in the you know mid 90s. I mean, like way back then, you know, and you're playing one of those games, and and you're in this situation where you you have, you know, you don't have a lot of leeway to make it through the the dumb level, and you screw up, and you're like, oh man, so you have to hit the reset button and start over. And so the the last five minutes of gameplay is erased because I hit that reset button and I can start over, and my little jumping worm guy with a suit and mask and all, all the dumb stuff he comes he's restored back to life and now i can start over right um well it's the same way we are we are new creatures and we're given that opportunity to completely start over um god uh takes all of that away and washes all that away and so the purpose of that is that henceforth we would not live unto ourselves but we would live unto him which died and rose again i'm, I'm teaching in the nursing home out of john 15 and i realized that um what God has done, what glorifies God when we bear much fruit, is that he took us, who were not producing fruit, who had no chance of producing fruit, and he, he takes and he grafts us back onto that vine, which is Jesus, and what he does is he makes us fruitful. He restores us to the original purpose that he had for us. When we were broken and, and irreparably broken, and, and there was no hope and there was no possibility of reclaiming these, these branches that we are as individuals, but he takes us and he restores us back to our original purpose, that we can glorify him. Right? Um, that, that's an amazing, it, it's, that's the amazing power of God that he can do something like that in the midst of all of our failure. You go down to verse 18, and it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What's the word of reconciliation? It's what I'm doing today. It's what we do on Saturdays. It's telling people how to be saved. It's preaching the gospel. It's preaching the gospel to every creature. It's, it's, it's uh, Matthew 28, um, uh, verses 18 through 20, which is really the, the lifeblood of open door, uh, the life verses of open door, which is, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The, the pattern of the believer, then, if you've received that gift of salvation, it is, not, it, it is not that you would live unto yourself anymore, but that you would live unto him. And, and his heartbeat and his, his motive and his drive is others. And telling them, the believer is to get saved, to get baptized, and then to start winning souls, to start preaching the gospel. There's no minimum requirement uh, of, of length of salvation before you can tell somebody how to be saved. If you've been saved, you know how to do it, you can start telling others. And you're not going to be real good at it, and you're not going to have verses memorized, but, you know, I'm not real good at it either. I've been doing it 10 years. I have verses, I have verses memorized. I'm still terrible at it. It's, it's not you that does the work. It's God that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work. It's just what he needs us to do is yield and to take on that ministry of reconciliation. Uh, not everybody's going to listen. If, uh, um, uh, not everybody's going to listen. If you go back to uh, Romans 10, Romans 10, uh, we'll look at, uh, let's see, verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And that's Isaiah 53.1, um, the, the huge prophetic chapter on Christ. And he's saying, who, who, who's believed this? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so a lot of people aren't going to listen. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, let's see, see where I want to go. I don't want to I got way too many verses here. Um, 
But nevertheless, um, we are without excuse. We, we've been given that ministry of reconciliation, and the motive is that we were saved not to live unto ourselves. See, the reason why we needed saved is because we were living unto ourselves. And if, if you're familiar with the proverb, I can't remember which chapter it is, but um, a backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. If, if you've not gotten to the point where you know what it's like to be filled with your own ways, you realize that it doesn't really pay to be a backslider very much. It, it's really not profitable. It really doesn't, excuse me, it really doesn't do good things for you. But a good man shall be satisfied from himself. And so the, the reason why we need to reconcile is because we were slaves to our own ways. And so then being delivered from our own ways, God gives us the opportunity very kindly. It's an opportunity. It's not a, it's not a chore. It's not a, you know, thou shalt, you know, angry, furrowed, um, bushy, eyebrowed preacher shouting at you from a pulpit in, in a dark, scary place. Thou shalt. It's not that. It's God says, I did something nice for you so that you get to do this. So that you get to be restored to your original purpose, um, and and that's a and that's a wonderful thing. And so what we become then is ambassadors for Christ. In verse twenty, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And that's what we are doing. We are going to people and we are standing in Christ's stead as ambassadors, and we are beseeching them, which is a uh, a, a wonderful King James word for begging them be reconciled to God. God paid an amazing price. He gave you, here is a free gift, and we beseech them, take it, and we implore them, and we, we see in uh, the end of the book of Jude that there's different ways to do it, You, but we, we, we beseech them, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. We stand in his place. We, are, we have gone um, in his place, and we stand here, and we, we beg you, be reconciled to God. And so that's um, that's Second Corinthians chapter 5, really all-encompassing. We see the resurrection body. We see the promise of it, what we had to look forward to, and that we're not doomed in this, in this life of flesh anymore. We're not doomed to the aches and the pains, but also the sorrows and the torments and all of that. The former things are going to pass away, and what we have is a promise that we cannot comprehend. That, that we can't understand. It, it is wonderful beyond our capacity to understand it. That mortality, that, that scary, humongous, looming thing of mortality is swallowed up of life. That life is so much bigger than that. We see what heaven is uh, and what we can expect in heaven. We see the judgment seat of Christ. We see the redemptive work of Jesus. And then we see the ministry of reconciliation that God has given to us. And that he has restored us to our original purpose. And, and to God be the glory that we don't have to live henceforth unto ourselves, but that we can live unto him which died for us and rose again. It's a wonderful opportunity we have. And so this chapter is really very encompassing of the Christian life. And I hope we can look at this and, and, and really uh, you know, have, some, have some clear teaching and some clear direction and just see that um, you know, maybe, maybe the, the larger point um, is just that God is good and, and how demonstrably good um, God is.